Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 724 for September 13th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. They see in us an opportunity uh, to, to be a leader in you know what has become a small but the fastest growing category in American whiskey, American single malt. And, uh, and we were excited to work with them together on that. There's been another deal in the American whiskey business between one of the major industry giants and an up-and-coming distiller. In this case, it's the biggest spirits producer in the world. Diageo's Distill Ventures Venture Capital Unit has done its first deal in the U.S. with a minority investment in westward American single malt whiskey. Tom Mooney is the CEO of House Spirits in Portland and one of the founders of Westward. He'll join us to discuss the deal on WhiskeyCast in depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and much more, all on the midweek episode of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. As always, we begin with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. The strike by union workers at Kentucky's Four Roses Distillery is in its seventh day now. No talks have been scheduled between management and the three unions on strike at both the distillery in Lawrenceburg and the Four Roses Bottling and Maturation Complex in Cox's Creek, Kentucky. Members of the United Food and Commercial Workers, Locals 10D and 23D, walked off the job last Friday, along with members of the National Conference of Firemen and Oilers, Local 320. They rejected the distillery's final contract offer by a 51-2 vote. Four Roses owner Kieran Holdings wants to implement a two-tier wage scale for new hires, along with changes in seniority rights, vacation time, and sick leave, according to the unions. And while Four Roses executives have declined interview requests, the distillery released this statement on Tuesday. And quoting now, We value our employees and recognize they are a crucial part of what makes Four Roses a special bourbon. We have been negotiating in good faith with the unions and offered a competitive package for our employees. It is our hope that the unions will reconsider their decision. Well, that's not likely to happen, according to UFCW Local 23D President Jeff Royalty. The union is still standing strong right now. Uh, We have no uh, inclination that anyone is willing to uh, change from our initial uh, way of thinking on on standing up for the next generation. And it just appears that uh, this thing is going to lead into the Bourbon Festival, and, and we are prepared. The distillery's Let's Talk Bourbon session with master distiller Brent Elliott is still on for this Friday morning at the distillery as part of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival, though ticket holders will have to cross the union's picket line to attend. The unions are also still planning to have a presence at the Bourbon Festival in Bardstown. If I'm in the Bourbon Festival uh, legitimately, you know, I will uh, walk around and, you know, I'm a, I'm a likable guy, I like to think. Uh, I can strike up a conversation with just about anybody. Uh, you know, I don't have to be handing out literature, but I think I can get my, my message across. Uh, you know, uh, I will have my uh, shirt on that it's got a message to it, but it's just enough to get your curiosity going. And you'll probably ask me what this shirt's about, and, and if you've got a minute, I'll take the time to tell you. Uh, no concessions, uh, my family matters. And uh, a lot of people are interested in that. Uh, we've had them for a couple weeks now, and... Uh, it appears to me that everywhere I go wearing it, somebody will stop and ask me what that's about. And it, it's a good conversation piece. 
However, Kentucky Bourbon Festival Executive Director Jill Hawkins says contingency plans are in the works should union workers try to picket at the festival. We have um, been in touch with our local law enforcement, and we will just make sure that all of our laws are um, followed correctly. And um, we'll just, if it, if it happens, we will support our local law enforcement in dealing with it in the manner that they see fit. Bardstown Police Assistant Chief Joe Seeley is coordinating public safety at the Bourbon Festival. You referenced earlier that uh, you had spoken to the leadership of the union and they were, in essence, uh, saying they were going to wear T-shirts and, and encourage question, you know, dialogue with people that may ask about the, the T-shirt they're wearing. Um, that's perfectly fine. One thing the, the law has talked about when it comes to, because that wouldn't meet the threshold of a protest in terms of what law enforcement would need to be engaged with. But uh, one thing the law talks about is time, place, and manner. And so should it be uh, hypothetically a, an actual protest of, say, 500,000 people, then we have set up a, an area within the event venue that uh, we would ask the protesters to actually do the actual protesting. But uh, as far as wearing the T-shirts and going out getting their message and things like that, that wouldn't meet the threshold with, to, to engage law enforcement at that point. But uh, we're there to protect the, the those that are going to the venue, the business owners, the citizens, the protesters themselves. Uh, you know, we want everybody to get along, and, and law enforcement will be there just to ensure everything goes smoothly. So far, only one festival event has been affected by the strike. As of now, Four Roses will not have teams competing in this year's World Championship Bourbon Barrel Relay that is scheduled for Saturday, unless there's a new contract agreement in time. Meanwhile, there's still a lot going on at the Bourbon Festival this weekend. There had been fears that rain from Hurricane Florence might head inland and reach Kentucky over the weekend, and that had Jill Hawkins checking her weather apps all week long. Every time I check... We get a stronger report that it might be a little warm, but we are going to be dry. It's going to be wet next week, but through this weekend, we are good to go. We're expecting a great time. We've got some great music lined up. We've got great food. Of course, we've got lovely bourbons, a great variety. Um, We've got new people, new craft distilleries participating in our sampler on Wednesday night, And so we're just excited to bring our guests things that we've never done before. One of the highlights of this year's festival will be held in Louisville for the first time. The Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame induction luncheon is usually held on the Wednesday of Festival Week in Bardstown. But scheduling conflicts forced this year's luncheon to be moved to the Fraser History Museum in Louisville. Freddie Johnson of Buffalo Trace, Beam Suntory CEO Matt Shattuck, and the late Dr. Pierce Lyons of Alltech and Lexington's Town Branch Distillery will be inducted into the Hall of Fame, while Heaven Hill President Max Shapira will receive this year's Parker Beam Lifetime Achievement Award, named for the longtime Heaven Hill Master Distiller. We'll have more on the Hall of Fame induction this weekend on Whiskey Cast. One more note out of bourbon country, 101 is a number that's been associated with wild turkey for years. It's the traditional proof that wild turkey bottled its whiskeys at for a long time. And on Monday, the father and son team of Jimmy and Eddie Russell celebrated a special anniversary, a combined 101 years of service at the distillery. That's 64 years for Jimmy and 37 for Eddie. And according to Eddie's son, Bruce, Jimmy still refers to Eddie as the new guy. Of course, Bruce has joined them in the family business as Wild Turkey's national brand ambassador. Congratulations to the entire family, and especially Jimmy Russell's extremely patient wife, Joretta. It's got to be hard being married to Bourbon's biggest rock star, with all those groupies and everything. In other news, the Scotch Whiskey Association has kicked off its latest bid to get the U.K. government to freeze or lower taxes on whiskey and other distilled spirits. Last November, Chancellor Philip Hammond froze spirits taxes in his autumn budget, 
And the SWA claims that freeze led to an additional 114 million pounds in tax revenue through increased sales between February and July. The association claims the UK's current spirits taxes are still 76% higher than the European Union average, making it more expensive to buy a bottle of scotch in Scotland than that same bottle would cost in France, Germany, or Spain. The SWA also released a new poll of Scots showing 57% of those surveyed believe the government should be doing more to support the Scotch whiskey industry. Hammond has not set a date for announcing the next budget. Reuters reports Hammond told members of Parliament Tuesday the budget could be delayed by planning for a likely European Council meeting in November to hammer out the final details on Brexit. Let's turn now to new whiskies. Last time around, we had details on most of the Diageo 2018 special releases from the Classic Malts range, but the 10th whiskey was officially unveiled on Tuesday. Cladoc is a blended malt featuring malts from six of Diageo's coastal distilleries. It's only the second time that a blended malt has been part of the special releases series, following last year's Collectivum, which used malts from all 28 of Diageo's malt whiskey distilleries in Scotland. Master blender Maureen Robinson says the idea with Cladoc was to come up with something different. The thing with this blend, the Cladoc blend, is it's, it's not only just six distilleries, it's also four different types of wood as well. So to get a blended malt where it's perfectly balanced, that you just have all, you know, you're not want one malt to dominate the other. And I think this year we've really got that. Four of those six coastal distilleries should be pretty obvious. Talisker, Oban, Lagavulin, and Kalila. But here's a challenge for you. Guess the other two. And here's a clue. All six of them are located within a mile of the Scottish coast. As for the Cladoc blend, it's one of the three whiskies in this year's series that will not be available in North America. It'll sell elsewhere for around £155 a bottle. That's around $204 at current exchange rates. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on, and you'll find my tasting notes for the rest of the 2018 special releases at WhiskeyCast.com. Beaumore is out with the third and final release in its Vintners Trilogy series, the 27-year-old Port Cask. It was matured for 13 years in ex-bourbon barrels, then transferred to port pipes for the rest of its maturation in Beaumore's number one vaults at the distillery on Isla. It's bottled at 48.3% ABV and will sell in the U.S. for around $520 a bottle. Glendronach is reviving the revival. It's 15-year-old single malt after a three-year absence. The Revival was one of the mainstays of the Glendronach range from 2009 until 2015, when it was discontinued because of a shortage of casks. Right now it's only available at the Glendronach Distillery's shop in Scotland, but will be available more widely starting next month, with the U.S. edition priced at around $90 a bottle. Elsewhere, Bame Suntory is releasing this year's third batch of Booker's. It's named Kentucky Chew after Booker Knows trademark method for tasting whiskeys. As always, it's bottled at cask strength, in this case 63.35% ABV or 126.7 proof. It'll sell for around $70 a bottle. And finally, the Balvenie is offering wealthy whiskey lovers a once-in-a-lifetime auction experience. It's working with Christie's on an online auction that includes the entire newly released Chapter 4 of the DCS Compendium Whiskies, selected by Maltmaster David Stewart. It also includes a trip to Scotland to visit the distillery for a behind-the-scenes tour. And there's also a car one of the bespoke Morgan V8 Roadsters that the Balvenny has been using for promotional purposes. The bidding opens on September 25th and ends on October 9th, and the Balvenny is expecting bids to start in the $100,000 range. 
On that note, we should mention that William Grant and Sons has now named David Stewart's heir apparent as malt master for the Balvenie. We heard from Kelsey McKechnie a few weeks ago when Grant's unveiled its fistful of bourbon bottling that she worked on. She has been named as David Stewart's apprentice, with the expectation that she'll eventually take over for him, but not until he's good and ready. Congratulations, Kelsey. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Need something to brighten up your day, but it may be too early to pour a dram of Highland Park? Well, if you have Spotify, check out the latest playlist curated by the staff at Highland Park's Visitors Center at the distillery on Orkney. It's a little eclectic, with classics and new music alike, just like Highland Park's whiskeys. Just search for Highland Park Whiskey on Spotify and check out the whiskeys at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. In addition to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival this weekend, M.B. Rowland Distillery in Pembroke, Kentucky, has a vintage crafts and cocktail festival on Friday and Saturday. The Virginia Craft Spirits Roadshow hits Fredericksburg and A. Smith Bowman Distillery on Saturday. Rebellion in Washington, D.C. has a Woodford Reserve Masterclass on the 18th. Twisted Tail in Philadelphia has its annual Whiskey Bonanza on the 20th. The Lakes Distillery in Setmerthy, England has its Autumn Whiskey Festival next Saturday, September 22nd. Also, the Liverpool Whiskey Festival is that day, and the Whiskey Affair in Winchester, England. Next weekend is also Whiskey Live in Paris, along with the Whiskey by the Sea Festival in Vlissingen, the Netherlands, and we'll be in Louisville with special coverage from Bourbon and Beyond. Right now, we have 223 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Just use the search button to find one near you or wherever you're traveling soon. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker Scotch whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like. I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging Hickian Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game on the telly, Alan. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. A few weeks ago, in episode 719, we visited House Spirits Distillery in Portland, Oregon, the home of Westward American Single Malt Whiskey. No clues at the time that Westward was about to make big news as the first known investment by Diageo's Distill Ventures unit in North America. Distill Ventures is Diageo's in-house venture capital unit. It searches out emerging spirits brands to invest in, taking a minority stake while also helping them build up their business. Now, I say known investment because unless the brand wants to make that partnership public, everything stays behind closed doors. We do know that Distill Ventures has done 15 deals so far, including Denmark's Stowning Whiskey, and Australia's Starward Whiskey. I talked with House Spirits CEO and Westward co-founder Tom Mooney on Wednesday in his first interview after the deal was announced. Well, we certainly weren't looking for another investor in, in a generic sense, but years ago we, 
we set out on this journey to to establish the leading American single malt program and brand in Westward. And you know, we're very proud of what we've accomplished up to now, uh, the building of the distillery and the production of the inventory that uh, you know, we're finally starting to bottle and send out to market. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we we always felt that you know if the right opportunity presented itself uh, to to partner with someone who brings expertise that is very specific to what we're doing, uh, who who really believes in in what we're doing and and can help us make you know Westward a successful brand around the country and around the world. That uh, we we certainly wouldn't you know walk away from that opportunity and. Uh, and so, you know, in Diageo, we found somebody who is the world's leading malt whiskey producer. Uh, so they they do the most of what we, you know, are working on and, and do the most of as well. Uh, they're also uh, somewhat, you know, unusually in the spirits world, one of the leading brewers in the world. And as you know, from having visited the Westward Distillery, you know, we're very committed to to the beer program that that is the basis for Westward and the quality of the beer that we make to distill into whiskey. Uh, and so in, in Diageo, we found, you know, a great partner uh, from both a single malt whiskey perspective and also a brewing perspective. Uh, and in Distill Ventures, uh, their accelerator with whom, you know, we'll work more closely with uh, a really great group of entrepreneurs whom we've known for many, many years. Uh, and so people we have always been very comfortable with and thought of as friends. And now we can work together and, and really help Westward realize all of the potential that we see in, in the product and the brand. And this is Distill's first venture, so to speak, in North America. They've uh, invested previously in Stowning Whiskey in Denmark and Starward in Australia. But they had not made any moves in the U.S. until now. What does it mean to you to be their first U.S. investment? Uh, I mean, we're we're tremendously proud. Uh, our our understanding is that they have made uh, fifteen investments around the world, uh, and that we're one of those. Um, you know, again, we're we're very proud of what we're doing. So we uh, we we're delighted when others see it and feel the same way we do. Uh, I I think we you know they see in us an opportunity. Uh, to to be a leader in you know what has become a small but the fastest growing category in American whiskey, American single malt, and uh, and we were excited to work with them together on that. Uh, I think I, I would say at the same time we're we're excited by the prospect of getting to know some of the other companies they have invested in because while they may be many thousands of miles away from Portland uh, in terms of distilling locations, uh, I suspect that we have shared experiences and the ability to learn from each other. So so it's a really cool ecosystem for for a whiskey distiller to, to be a part of. Now, this sort of splits up the existing House Spirits distillery brands because this deal is only for Westward, but you also produce uh, Volstead Vodka, Casa Magdalena Rum, and the Krogstad Aquavit. How does this work with those, or will those continue to be separate and distributed separately under House Spirits while Westward stays on its own and, I would presume, is going to go into the Diageo distribution network at some point? Uh, it, so actually, it, it will not. And so so I, I, I am grateful to you for asking this question because this is... Um, it's really it's very important for us to to get this message out clearly that uh, nothing has changed in terms of the products that House Spirits is supplying into the market. Uh, we we are still, as you say, the the producer and the supplier of Westward and Volstead and Casa Magdalena and Krogsta, uh still through Park Street as we have always done it still into you know the network of distributors we have worked with for years um, anchored by Southern Glazers and so nothing has changed today versus you know any time in the past few weeks months or years uh, for anybody who um, 
who wants to work with any of those brands. Uh, and actually, the Westward will not be going into uh, the Diageo sales structure uh, or uh, the Diageo organization within some of our distributors. Uh, it will remain independent. Uh, and so four months ago, we began work with a third-party sales company called Redwood Brands. Uh, Redwood is uh, is a Distill Ventures and Diageo uh, backed organization, but they're completely independent from uh, from the the Diageo organization within the company or within uh, some of the distributors, uh, and so nothing will change in that sense as well. Uh, Redwood was our sales organization last week and will be no changes there in all of the brands that have traditionally been associated with House Spirits. Now, what happens from this point on? Because you're talking about a 40% increase, I believe, in production capacity starting next year. What all do you do with the money that uh, is coming in from Distill Ventures as part of their minority stake? Of course. Uh, so the, this investment from Diageo helps us fund uh, the last part of what has been a long-term investment plan uh, that we we embarked on five years ago uh, that involved building the, the distillery that we're now in in Portland and building whiskey inventory uh, and you know, a number of other projects. And so so this investment essentially completes that overall capital plan uh, that we had in place before this, uh, and it will allow us to not only continue to produce westward at the rates we have historically, but uh, to make um, some investments within the current distillery to increase fermentation capacity and with that uh, to increase output. Uh, but it really is it's part of a plan that we had put in place many years ago, uh, and we're delighted that they you know, came in as our partner and, and have allowed us to fund that final part of that. Uh, and, and in terms of what comes next, you know, we, we've had a plan in place for some time. Uh, I am personally delighted that I can now you know, go to market with that plan with a partner you know, next to me in, in Diageo and Distill Ventures who has so much experience doing some of the things we're, we're planning to do. When we talked last week with the folks at Wyoming Whiskey who had done a similar deal like this with Edrington last week, part of their concern was over access to market and distribution and getting their products on as many shelves as possible in the U.S. If you're not going into the Diageo system and you're staying within Redwood Brands, how do you get to that point as well with Westward? There's no question that bringing brands to market is more difficult now than it has ever been. Um, and so uh, certainly going into the existing uh, Diageo structure within that company and, and within the distributors would be one way to accelerate distribution, uh, but it's it's not the only way. And And so I would call out the fact that Redwood Brands, while established independently and run separately from the larger Diageo sales organization, uh, is a Diageo-backed sales organization. Uh, so I, the way we view it is we, we are getting tremendous sales and distribution support from a Diageo sales organization, but instead of being one that's embedded within the company, it's one that operates independently, and we like that. Uh, because we're getting the resources and support that we need uh, for this particular moment in Westward's development. Uh, but we also, you know, get a level of attention uh, and uh, and an ability to influence, you know, the way Redwood goes to market that really wouldn't be realistic for a brand our size in a much larger sales organization. So I think Redwood is the right organization you know, at the right size with the right culture for, for a brand like us. So you're not going to get lost in the shuffle as you might in the larger Diageo organization where your output is a rounding error compared to the sales of brands like Johnny Walker and Smirnoff and the other big brands they sell. 
this way you get more personal attention? Yes. I mean, it, it, from a, I mean, from, from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, we would rather be, you know, a very large supplier to more of a I'll call it life-size organization uh, as opposed to a very small one in a much larger organization. But I think it, it goes beyond just, you know, the, the numbers and, and it's about the people. So Scott Height, who leads Redwood Brands, uh, is someone I think the world of. And uh, it was important to us as we considered you know, this move that, you know, our, our brand would be in the hands of someone I've known for a long time, who's building an amazing team. Uh, so it, it really is more an extension of how we do business, which is people first. And if we have a great team in place, um, you know, the world around us will change, but there's nothing we can't do if we have the right team in place. And this is a minority stake, which means that you and your current partners will retain majority control and continue to run the business, right? Correct. Um, the The investment from Diageo is a minority stake. Uh, it allows uh, my partners and I to you know, to retain a majority interest in our company, and more importantly, to to continue to operate it independently as we have. Uh, you know, I like the fact that you know what what Diageo through Distill Ventures wanted to invest in uh, wasn't physical assets or, you know, a warehouse full of whiskey. Uh, It was a team and a plan that is already in place and uh, that, if you will, they they bought into what we're doing and want to be on this journey with us. uh, And we're delighted to have them on the journey. But, But it is very much about following the the plan that we created years ago and the vision that we've had for longer than that for building westward into the leading American single bond. I know when I spoke with the folks at Stowning in Denmark about their deal with Distill a couple of years ago, they confirmed that the deal includes a right of first refusal if you and your partners ever decide that you want to get out of the business for Distill Ventures slash Diageo to uh, buy the remainder of the business. Is that the case here as well? Uh, it is. Uh, so there, you know, for reasons that I know you understand, I, I can't comment uh, extensively on on what the terms of, of the deal are in the long run. But uh, there is definitely a path uh, for Diageo to, um, to acquire the remaining equity stake in the company. Uh, and likewise, there's a path for the original partners uh, to acquire the Diageo stake back as well. So it, we're, we're embarking on this with the expectation that we're going to be very successful together uh, and that many years down the road we will figure out you know, what, what the best ownership structure for the brand is. Uh, but for now, we're focused on uh, getting from here to there, if you will, and, and turning you know, westward uh, into everything it can be. Thanks to Westward's Tom Mooney for spending some time with us on what was a very busy day Wednesday. You can listen to our tour of the distillery in episode 719. It's available on your favorite podcast app and at whiskeycast.com. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla Single Malt. Look for the classic 16-year-old Lagavulin, the Distiller's Edition, the throwback eight-year-old Lagavulin, and coming soon to a whiskey shop near you, this year's annual release of Lagavulin 12-year-old. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill. Limestone Branch Distillery in Kentucky has just unveiled the 2018 edition of its Yellowstone Bourbon Limited Edition release. It will not be available yet for a couple of weeks, but I just got around to tasting the 2017 batch. There is some common ground here because the charred oak wine casks that were used for finishing the 2017 edition were also used for this year's release. It's bottled at 50.5% ABV. The nose is aromatic and spicy with hints of dark pepper and clove, along with toasted oak, burnt caramel, 
butterscotch, and honey. The taste is spicy and intense with black pepper and chili powder notes, balanced by butterscotch, caramel, and vanilla in the background, and just a hint of charred oak. The finish is long with lingering spices and a gentle sweetness. I'm scoring the 2017 Yellowstone Bourbon Limited Edition a 92, and I'll have tasting notes for the 2018 edition soon at WhiskeyCast.com. I received a sample from our friends at Highland Park the other day, the new 18-year-old Viking Pride Travel Edition. This one is a beefed-up version of their classic 18-year-old. It's bottled at 46% ABV instead of the standard 43%, and this one is only available in travel retail, hence the name Travel Edition. The nose is very aromatic with a gentle peatiness, and hints of cherry cobbler, cocoa beans, and honey. The taste starts off with chocolate-covered cherries, followed by a mouth-filling peatiness that is balanced well by a hint of spice, cocoa powder, and honey. The finish is long with a gentle smokiness, soft spices, and just a hint of dark chocolate. It's really hard to outdo the original, but I'm scoring the Highland Park 18 Viking Pride Travel Edition a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, proud to announce the 2018 edition of Parker's Heritage Collection. This year's edition carries on Parker Beam's legacy of excellence and innovation with a unique bourbon finished in orange curacao barrels that accent the bourbon's own natural hints of citrus. Once again, sales of this year's edition of the Parker's Heritage Collection will benefit the ALS Association. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Now, let's look at the Cladoc blended malt that Diageo's Maureen Robinson told us about earlier. This one is a blend of whiskeys from six coastal distilleries bottled at 57.1% ABV. And once again, it will not be coming to the North American market. The nose is rich and complex with baked apples, honey, nutmeg, and a subtle touch of oak. The taste is also complex with a good balance of spices and sweetness. Allspice, clove, nutmeg, and ginger root are complemented nicely by butterscotch, honey, dried apples, and just a hint of oak that comes out as the spices start to fade. The finish is long and well-balanced with lingering spices and a subtle sweetness. I'm scoring the Cladoc Blended Malt from Diageo's 2018 Special Releases series a 93. And if you're still trying to figure out what those other two distilleries are, keep listening. Of course, Oban is one of the malts that went into Cladoc. And while that blend is not coming to North America, the Oban 21-year-old certainly will. It was matured in refill American oak butts and bottled at 57.9% ABV. The nose has notes of toasted oak, smoked salmon, toffee, vanilla, and just a hint of citrus. The taste is thick, peppery, and slightly astringent with oak tannins, orange peel, clove, and just a touch of spearmint in the background. The finish is long, dry, and spicy with that same touch of spearmint, And I'm scoring the Oban 21-year-old a 94. I've added all of these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,300 whiskeys from all over the world. You can always use your smartphone to search the list at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition a quintessential single-pot still Irish whiskey finished in first-fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. I had a question come in on Twitter just as we were finishing up work on the last episode this weekend. Michael Barris from Maryland wanted some help, 
after his most recent order from Brook Laddie's online shop. Here's what he had to say. Can you provide any insights into a new VAT charge? Brook Laddie charged a new 6% VAT on a recent shipment of their yellow submarine bottles shipped to the U.S. They charged shipping, shipping VAT, plus the additional 6% VAT. Now, if you're not familiar with VAT, it stands for Value Added Tax. It's also known as VAT. And it works a lot like the sales taxes that many U.S. states collect. We asked the distillery for an explanation, but Michael was able to get one even faster. He tweeted, David, in the Brooklady retail shop, clarified the tax is not VAT. It is sales tax imposed by my state, Maryland. In June, the U.S. Supreme Court started requiring online retailers to collect it, so it is new. I didn't think about the impact on foreign companies, but it makes sense. And he's right, it does make sense. Even though the Brooklady distillery is on Isla, it is owned by Remy Cointreau, which does have a physical presence in the U.S., and that would make it subject to the Supreme Court's ruling on sales taxes for online purchases. Now, it was most likely listed as a VAT tax on Michael's receipt because that was the closest equivalent in the distillery's computer system. And full props to Brook Laddie's unnamed social media guru, who responded with this to Michael's second tweet. Glad you managed to clarify. I got as far as, quote, it's correct and has been charged in the past, just no one has noticed before. I'll make your comment our official response from now on, with a winking emoji. Michael's response, glad to help, emoji smiley face. Now, could you just ship me one of those extra bottles of black art or yellow submarine as a thanks? Winking emoji. Michael, let us know if that happens. Now, when I shared my tasting notes for the Talisker 8-year-old last time around, I mentioned that I was really disappointed that it is not coming to the U.S. At Turnip Whiskery on Twitter had this comment, you weren't kidding about not being happy when I heard your tasting notes for the Talisker 8. That's the one I was most excited to find. Guess I'll need to go buy a bottle of whiskey to drown my sorrows. Too bad you won't be able to do that with a Talisker 8. And we had a lot of reaction to the unusual early announcement of this year's Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame inductees. The names are normally kept secret until the actual luncheon begins each year. But the class of 2018 is already getting a lot of congratulations on social media. Mark Williams in Lexington, Kentucky, at Live Paint on Instagram, was just one of those really happy to see Buffalo Trace's Freddie Johnson named to the Hall of Fame. Here's what he had to say. Freddie! He's the best guide in the industry. I'm happy to hear the good news. I was just talking about him tonight. And by the way, we will not be in Kentucky this weekend for the Bourbon Festival. But since I am moderating a Bourbon and Beyond session with Freddie next weekend, it's a safe bet we'll have him on the show next weekend from Louisville. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us online at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. We mentioned the new Cladoc blended malt from Diageo during the news, and I had my tasting notes for it just a couple of minutes ago. It's being billed as a coastal malt, since it uses malt whiskies from six distilleries along the Scottish coast. Now, coastal is not an official whiskey region of Scotland. Just like the term islands that appears on some Scotch whiskies, it's created by the marketing folks, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there are only five official whiskey regions in Scotland. Isla, Campbellton, the Lowlands, the Highlands, and Speyside, which is officially a subset of the Highlands region. 
Distilleries in Speyside can label their whiskeys as either Highland or Speyside if they want to. And they're technically not required to include a regional designation on the label if they don't want to. It's sort of like an age statement. You don't have to include one, but if you do, it has to accurately reflect where the distillery is located. Now, I've been teasing you throughout this episode with those two other coastal distilleries that are used to make the Kladak blended malt. Ready for the answer? They're both officially Highland whiskeys from Inchgower and Kleinleash. If you've ever driven up Scotland's A9 highway north of Inverness and seen Kleinleash off to your left, it's on the inland side of the road. How might that qualify as a coastal distillery? Well, Diageo defined the term as a distillery within a mile of the coast, and Kleinleash just barely meets that definition by a few hundred feet. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for our WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast and our WhiskeyCast HD videos, along with the latest whiskey news, events, the Whiskey Photo of the Week, and a whole lot more, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes dating back to 2005. I hope you'll help a friend discover WhiskeyCast this week. Take a minute and show them how you download each episode using your phone's podcast app. Better yet, show them on their phone. And show them how to subscribe for free so they get each episode as soon as it's online. You can also help other whiskey lovers discover the show by posting reviews and ratings for WhiskeyCast on your podcast apps, too. We're on social media at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.